Welcome to another podcast of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. We're a collection of journalists and wellness professionals. We'd like to give you the latest information that's out there. And this uh, edition, this podcast, this next few minutes, I tell you, this is some of the, the most fun that I've ever had doing this job. We're going to interview Dr. Michael Greger. He is the uh, voice behind nutritionfacts.org. He's one of the best researchers out there, one of the driest sense of humor. So, uh, you know, we get along great. Today is October 7th, 2014. And uh, this is just going to be a great, uh, a great interview. We did the interview actually earlier today. Uh, I finally tracked him down using my Google robots uh, in, a, in a, a Toronto hotel room. Uh, he is just one of the uh, most interesting characters out there, puts out a lot of videos. You really should have him on your subscription list, uh, Dr. Michael Greger, coming up. And also in this, uh, this podcast, we're going to be talking to the general manager of the East End Food Co-op. Uh, his name is Justin Pizzella, and we're going to talk about an event coming up uh, at CMU in a couple weeks called Know Your GMOs. Uh, this is going to be really interesting. Had that interview with him today as well. Coming up in future podcasts, we've got uh, Jim Donovan coming back. Uh, he is uh, going to be doing a thing this weekend down in Mount Pleasant. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, he's a former drummer from Rusted Root, and he is going to tell us all about a uh, little more in detail about how he uses drumming to tr uh, work with uh, autistic kids and all sorts of interesting things. Uh, and he'll tell the best rock and roll story you will ever hear. I promise you that. And then in two weeks, uh, we've got Dr. Nancy Marammer coming on. Uh, she's just released a book called Get Real, How to Produce Your Own Life, or Produce Your Own Life. Uh, she dropped the how-to, I guess. Just produce it. Get out there and do it. Uh, she's an old friend of mine and a great psychologist, media professional, uh, a very interesting person to talk to. So very much looking forward to that. So let's get right into the calendar for this week. Uh, as we said, this weekend is the Sound Empowerment Workshop that's coming up in uh, Mount Pleasant is actually where it is, jimdonovanmusic.com. Uh, if you are a wellness professional of any kind and you would like to add a few very interesting tools to your toolbox, this really is the workshop to go to. Jim is a great guy. I promise you three days of drumming bliss, October 10th through the 12th. Coming up uh, the next weekend after that, October 17th through the 19th, it's the Heal Thy Practice Conference. Uh, we interviewed Eric Goldman a few weeks ago. Uh, very interesting combination of integrative medicine, business, and marketing. Three days uh, just north of New York City. On the 18th of October, uh, it's Know Your GMOs coming up uh, at CMU, as we said. Uh, we're going to have a conversation with Justin about that uh, a little bit later in this podcast. And uh, on October 31st and November 1st, Neural Reset Therapy happening at the Pittsburgh School of Massage. You know, we uh, interviewed Ralph, uh, what was it, last week? Uh, day goes by so fast. Uh, he is such an interesting guy. If you didn't watch that podcast, go back and watch that. Neural Reset Therapy. And then right after that, the Pittsburgh School of Massage will be up at Seven Springs for their uh, CE conference. Uh, we have talked to Dean Juhan. He is also another podcast that you probably want to go back and watch. And... Uh, a couple of fun events coming up in November. Dr. Vonda Wright is presenting the Women's Health uh, Health Con Conversations, uh, and that's at womenshealthconversations.com. That's November 6th. I'll be there with uh, Trent Nazipak and the uh, Organically Social Gang. And then on the uh, 8th and 9th of November at uh, Moxie Mind and Body at Market Square, it's Anatomy Trains for Movement Therapists. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, piece, uh, kind of work. And if you are a movement therapist, you want to get a hold of, uh, uh, what's her name, Aubrey there at Moxie, moxiemindandbody.com to find out more about that. And November 15th, Juice Fest, uh, getorganicallysocial.com is where you can find out more about that. Uh, Juice Fest is going to be a lot of fun, uh, a, a few hours of juicing and uh, voting and contests and everything like that. So... That is it for the calendar this week. Uh, coming up next, it's the interview I did earlier today with Dr. Michael Greger. So today we're talking with Dr. Michael Greger. He is an internationally acclaimed speaker, a physician, author, an expert on nutrition, food safety, and public health. 
currently serves as the public health director for the Humane Society of the United States of America, this country we live in. He is also the voice behind uh, NutritionFact.org, uh, which is a nonprofit and strictly non-commercial uh, service that uh, provides public uh, information about the latest, info the latest uh, science behind nutrition. He produces several videos a week. I, I can't get enough of them. Uh, an ongoing, uh, an annual video uh, that is available via DVD or download that, that is a compilation of the latest science. This year's was called Table to Able, and it premiered at the Johnstown Vegetarian Fest, which he attends every year. Welcome, Dr. Michael Greger. So glad to be here. Um, I've been looking forward to interviewing you for such a long time. Um, and one of the things I've noticed about people that are kind of in this, uh, the, the, what used to be the fringe areas, what I hopefully are now becoming the mainstream areas of nutrition, um, is that you generally people wind up being interested in this based on their own personal crisis or a crisis uh, from somebody else in their life. Tell us, you know, besides just being a doctor, what is it that got you interested specifically in nutrition? and uh, filling this void of the lack of nutritional information that's out there? It was actually my grandmother, uh, my, uh, my dad's mom, who, uh, when I was just a little kid, was um, uh, basically diagnosed with end-stage heart disease. She already had a few bypasses and at a certain point just kind of run out of plumbing. Um, and so she, you know, uh, confined a wheelchair, crushing chest pain, basically sent home to die. Um, and uh, then she heard then she, she heard on 60 Minutes about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, who was starting this kind of lifestyle medicine clinic out in California, and she was actually one of his first patients, and actually she's featured in the biography about him, uh, The Man Who Healed America's Heart, uh, where it talks about Francis Greger, who arrived in a wheelchair crushing chest pain, um, and then a few weeks later was walking 10 miles a day, and she goes on to... She was uh, diagnosed at uh, 65 um, and went on to live another 31 years with her six grandkids, including me. And uh, that's, you know, for a kid, you know, it's, you get to play with grandma again. But, uh, but uh, you know, that it's fun. I just kind of grew up with that kind of vision of medicine. I, like, you know, heal, you know, hand, you know, <laughs> like, you know, um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, you place your hands on someone and they jump up and they... Um, uh, then little did I know that uh, unfortunately very little medicine is uh, is like that, particularly with chronic disease. Um, but uh, so that's why I went to medicine, and it was really uh, Dr. Dean Ornish's uh, publication in the Lancet in 1990, the Lifestyle Heart Trial, that showed for the first time, uh, you know, angiographic evidence. We had this kind of you know we could see in black and white these arteries opening up um, without drugs, without surgery. Um, so the reversal of atherosclerosis, our number one killer. Um, now, Pritikin, you know, was doing this with thousands of people, but all you had was just kind of clinical. You know, they'd come in, they claimed they had chest pain, and they claimed chest pain went away. Um, but for the first time, you know, what Ornish did was bring the kind of, uh, you know, kind of the, you know, show it in black and white, basically. Um, and so that was it for me. And so since that day, I mean, since 1990, the, no one else should have died from heart disease. Unfortunately, there's been a few since in the last, uh, you know, 20 years. Um, one or two, I think, have, uh, have died of cardiovascular disease. One or two. It's like, look, we have the miracle cure. Um, we cannot just prevent treat, arrest, but reverse in the majority of patients. Um, and so that really, I mean, that really what uh, drove me into this. And that is, you know, and so I've kind of dedicated my life to just bring this science out into the public consciousness, consciousness and into the medical establishment. Because it's not, I mean, it's not like, I mean, we need tons more research on so many things. But, I mean, we have enough research already to, you know, wipe out, uh, you know, type 2 diabetes and hypertension and, you know, heart disease. But, you know, until, you know, should we spend another penny more while someone still dies of a heart attack on the planet? I mean, that's that seems um, like we have bad priority. Well, that's, that's actually uh, an area that I wanted to get into some was uh, all the money that goes towards research and, you know, what are the things that are actually killing us and why, well, like you said, what what else do we need to research about heart disease other than trying to find a new drug, um, 
you know, we, we, it's, like you say, been pretty well established. Nobody should have died since 1990 from heart disease. But it, let, let's just, let me give you a hypothetical here. If everyone who has heart disease goes on uh, a plant-based diet, follows your, your guidelines strictly, realistically, what percentage of those people can reverse the heart disease? Is it 80, 90 percent? So 80. Yeah, so it's about 80 percent. So 90 percent of the angina is gone. Um, but in terms of that uh, clinical reversal where we actually see the um, arteries opening up, the plaque stabilizing, we've only seen about 80 percent of the people. So, you know, uh, how many, what, 600,000 people die of cardiovascular disease? So, so you know, yeah. we, can get a, we can get a big chunk of those. Um, and in terms of the rest, um, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, Ornish and Esselstyn showed is that, you know, we can forestall uh, cardiovascular events. Um, I think the event rate in, uh, you know, Esselstyn's new case series um, was uh, 0 0.6 percent. So it, it basically, one could say, it worked in 99.4 percent of people, at least in the uh, four-year follow-up. Wow. Uh, I, I do want to drill down uh, some in, in the nutrition, uh, but before we get to that real quick, um, you know, when we talk about lifestyle medicine, it seems like uh, <clears throat> the more people you talk to, a, a very well-respected doctor here in Pittsburgh, uh, Dr. Betsy O'Neill, and uh, you and her and many others have said the three basic pillars, uh, if you want to take control and call it, you know, lifestyle medicine, are um, nutrition, exercise, and some form of regular de-stressing of the, of the mental and nervous system. Uh, would you basically say that's about right? Um, well, uh, so I don't know, where does sleep fit in? Is that part of the uh, de-stressing? Uh, yeah, sleep is good. That's an important one. Um, that's actually a very important one. Uh, I mean, you know the you know the uh, you know the role of stress. You know, I think is you know. So if you look at um, you know during uh, World War II, some uh, you know European countries. Um, that were blockaded by the Nazis, and all of a sudden they were forced to eat healthy just because all the, uh, you know, all they had was plants because all the animals went to the occupying um, German army. Um, and the, and uh, heart disease rates plummeted, diabetes rates plummeted. Now there was also caloric restriction at the same time, so it's this combination of a more plant-based diet with caloric restriction. Chronic disease rates dropped. Now, you cannot say Nazi-occupied Europe was a low-stress situation, right? And so here we set up this kind of natural experiment, right, where yeah. we say, okay, what's more important, right? Is it diet? Is it stress? And very clearly, you see, even under the most stressful conditions, you change the diet, it doesn't matter. I mean, we evolved, I mean, stress wow. kind of has a hormetic quality in that, I mean, you know, we evolved, but that's the, I mean, to, to kind of high stress situations. Otherwise, we don't survive very long. And so, um, you know, it may be, you know, being stressed may be kind of physiological rather than pathological. But you know, eating the kind of junk we're doing, our sedentary lifestyle, um, a disruption of our sleep patterns. These are the things that um, you know our bodies just weren't kind of weren't built to withstand. Well, it, it, and it, I promise we're going to get to nutrition, but I, I really love this one uh, uh, video you, you've released recently about um, uh, meditation and how mm. it actually will uh, increase the length of the telomeres. Am I saying that right? Yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Just 12 minutes yeah. a day? Yeah. Just 12 minutes a day? And, right, and, right. Now, that's, and that was uh, really surprising. And so they... Um, you know, they, uh, you know, much of the earlier literature was, you know, studying people on these kind of Zen retreats where you go and for kind of weeks at a time, and yes, you could see benefits, but the generalizability of that data to the general public is very, you know, it's like, you know, it's like Kempner in the, in the 50s showing that if you put people on a rice and fruit diet, you can do all sorts of really neat things, but it's like, who cares? I mean, because, you know, how do we... You know, we can't translate that into the, I mean, who cares for the general population, maybe in certain therapeutic situations, but it's like, you know, that's not useful for us. Um, and so similarly, you know, that's, that's, that's nice, that's interesting, but right, but, but there, there's newer data says that even 
you know, just the, the small little, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, periods of meditation can um, significantly, uh, effectively slow down cellular aging, whatever kind of clinical, um, you know, uh, correlates that may have. Uh, but, uh, you know, that was, that was really kind of exciting. And so, and that's the kind of, you know, translatable information that we could use, right? I mean, if it, you know, uh, you know, simulate, you know, how much sleep we get, what to eat. These are things that we can actually modifiable risk factors. We have a little power over. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's get into uh, how you collect your data. What data do you think is important? Uh, there's a lot of emphasis placed on these double-blind uh, placebo. Uh, you know, this is the gold standard kind of, of the science. Are those? Primarily, the studies you look at, or what other kind of studies do you look? Well, at? I mean, yeah, I mean, I would love to just look at a lot more um, RCTs, these randomized controlled trials. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to do in in, uh, in the field of nutrition because people tend to know what they what what's stuck in their mouth. Um, you know, for drugs, these are perfect, right? We do a we do a sugar pill, we do a you know a, we do an active activity, and then we can swap them back and forth and do all sorts of neat things. No one's the wiser. But we put them on a different diet and kind of kind of notice. Now there have been kind of creative solutions to that. Um, so um, you can put people on. Uh, you can change someone's change someone's diet to kind of the target diet, and the other group you can try to change their diet in kind of weird ways, but in not ways that we think might be therapeutic, right? We can say, okay, you know, don't eat any foods that start with the letter B or something, and then you know, so there's a dietary change, but um, or or they do or they add placebos or or, or so they, they say don't change your diet but take the sugar pill of course they don't call it sugar pill you know this pill will help you lose weight and the other group actually change so there's kind of ways you can try to kind of mediate the placebo effect um, uh, which which can be very powerful uh, but uh, but you know in general um, what we like to see are interventional trials right so if you do a cross sectional study. That shows that people that eat healthy have lower rates of depression. Well, you say, well, wait, it's the snapshot in time. You can't prove cause and effect. You don't know which came first. Maybe people who uh, eat healthy uh, elevates their mood, or maybe people who are depressed eat lousy because they just go to McDonald's all the time. They don't want to cook. Um, and so that, then, you know, you can move to kind of cohort studies. You take a group of people who, who start out not depressed, right? As the inclusion criteria, and then follow them over time, and then look at their diet, and then follow them over the time, and see if people who are eating healthier actually do better in terms of lower rates of suicide, depression, etc. Uh, but even better than this, so that's that's most of what we have in nutritional medicine: these uh, prospective cohort studies, which we can have huge studies, uh, hundreds of thousands of people. You can get a sense by um, you know uh, at least we can get this kind of temporal analysis of what came first. But ideally, we want to do an interventional study. We want to know if you take people, change their diet, what happens. Um, the reason that's difficult, you can do that short term, right? So you can do that for kind of risk factor, and you can see what happens to their cholesterol and blood pressure. But what we want, ideally, are these hard endpoints like death, right? Or hospitalizations or diagnoses. Uh, it was a little softer, but um, uh, you know. So, but the thing is, to get those, you need a huge number of people. And you need you know, a long period of time. And it's difficult to get people to radically change their diet in a randomized manner, right? You change your diet radically one way, and the other person, you change your diet radically another way. And then you stick with that new diet for two years, right? right? That's what we'd like to see. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to get people in uh, kind of a, in a free living population. Now you stick. Now you know they've done prison studies and other ways where you kind of you can actually force people to eat certain ways. Um, uh, but um, uh, you know it comes down to you know this kind of intention to treat analysis. It's like, well, okay, well, what if you just tell people to eat healthy? Or some people will, some people won't. But but that's what we have in the real world. We can't lock people up in prison. So um, uh, you know, let, so it's worthwhile to do a study where you just say, here, try to change your diet and see what happens. If we have benefits, and we can say, look, telling people try to change your diet helps. Um, but it's also important to know what happens to people who actually do change their diet, right? I mean, and so then, um, you know, you do analyses of just adherent folks, um, and then you can see, well, okay, if you do want to stop this disease, reverse this disease, 
if you do this, you'll get this. At least we can say that, and whether or not they actually do it is up to them. Yeah. Well, I, I interviewed Louis Melmadrona, and he really explained this very well about how, you know, these uh, the double blind studies are really good for one pill versus another, or one pill versus a placebo. But as you said, when you try to get uh, a bunch of people to change their lifestyle, it's a whole different animal. It, it seems like there's more and more of these studies out there, or maybe I'm just paying attention to you more. Is there more uh, of these studies, and who's doing the research right now? Yeah, well, the latest big one was this Predimit study out of Spain, which randomized 7,000 people, about 7,400 people, um, into three groups, um, and then followed them out for um, uh, for about four years. Um, I mean, that's that is you know, it's almost unheard of in the dietary world to take thousands of people randomized into different diets. Um, uh, now, of course, the problem is people don't stick to the diets, and so by the end, you know. But um, but it was actually showed some. But it would if you whatever you do find is that much more powerful. Is that much more evidence? Right? I mean, that's the best type of evidence we have. We randomize people. Um, and then, so you can say with confidence that, um, for example, they found that those at, who added about half an ounce of nuts to their daily diet, um, which is like a small palm full of nuts, um, cut their stroke risk in half. Now, so, but this wasn't a cohort study where, you know, the people that happened to be eating that many nuts had half the stroke rate because, look, maybe people who eat nuts also exercise more. Maybe people who eat nuts, you know, are... are higher socioeconomic class. I mean, you know, so there's all sorts of confounding studies, but if you have a randomized trial where you take people who have baseline, all kind of this, you know, and you split them up, and the groups are the same when you start, and all you do, you know, you tell them, don't exercise anymore, don't change your diet, but just do these things, and then you can show that they actually did those things. You can actually measure phenolics in the urine. You can see, are they eating walnuts or are they not eating walnuts? Are they, you know... Um, and uh, and then you say okay, and then you can say not just nut consumption is associated with lower stroke risk, but if you eat nuts, at least in your um you know uh, you know if you're belong if you happen to be a uh, high cardiovascular risk Spanish patient, <laughs> if you eat nuts, um uh, you know we would expect to cut your stroke risk in half. That's huge. That is that is. I mean, that's about as good as gold as we can get in the uh, nutrition world. Who funded that study? It was funded by the Spanish government. Um, and so it was public, I mean, because obviously the, no one else is going to fund it. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's very important to have public monies. You know, we are privatizing uh, medical research, but if you privatize medical research, you're only going to see research done on things that are profitable and patentable, and uh, broccoli isn't. And that's really the rub right there. Uh, I believe I've seen interviews where you say there are many cancer drugs which are actually less effective at killing cancer than broccoli. Is that basically true? Oh, well, in vitro. Um, uh, but, uh, but what we need are clinical studies. Okay. okay. Right. No, but like in a Petri dish, um, the way, you know, so you drip broccoli on some, and look, it can be a colon cancer cell. So a colon cancer cell is actually exposed to broccoli, physically, right? I mean, your broccoli you eat rubs up against your lining. All right, so you draw, so you drip some, you know, broccoli. The amount of broccoli one would expect, the concentration of broccoli one would expect in the lumen of the intestine on some colon cancer cells, and the colon cancer cells either stop growing or dying. You say, well, wait a second, we want a positive control. Maybe, you know, for some reason in the lab they would have died anyway. And so you can not just drip nothing on them, but you can also drip something that we know kills cancer cells, like chemotherapeutic agents that we give specifically to kill cancer cells. And you can show that in some cases, yes, indeed, these you know natural products like broccoli um, uh, actually do better at killing cancer cells than drugs we have designed to kill cancer cells. Well, that's that that kind of stuff is just fascinating. It completely blows my mind. Uh, I want to get into a little bit about. Um, you know, the amount of money that goes into different kinds of research, um, and, and part, of the, part of that factor is the, uh, thank goodness, we don't die of diseases 
in relation to the same amount of noise that gets made about them on TV. Otherwise, half <laughs> the population of America would be dead from Ebola right now. Indeed. Um, <laughs> so I know that part of the uphill battle of you and all of us that you know are, are championing natural health is a lot of media perception, and uh, and then uh, this whole idea that you know we're going to raise money for research and that's going to that's going to cure the problem, and help me out on this part of it. It seems like many of the organizations that get money raised for them, they're not looking for a cure. They're looking for a pharmaceutical or procedural cure. Is that pretty much right? Or uh... um, no. Well, um, it, 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 so it depends on where they're getting the money from. A lot of these um, uh, kind of uh, these uh, kind of disease organizations. Although, you know, they do make the little please, please send us your five dollars, most of their money is actually coming from Big Pharma. I mean, it's actually coming from these drug companies. Um, and so, look, if your money's coming from Big Pharma, then you're, you know, you're, you're going to pour all the money into Big Pharma. And so basically, you know, it's like, you know, it's like when the NIH, you know, uh, you know studies a drug, so you pu you, the, 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 it's publicly funded, but then the profits are privatized. So it's like our money that proved that drug X is great, but then drug X is, is given to some pharmaceutical company, and then they charge the government, Medicaid, Medicare, huge profit. Wait a second, we're the ones that showed it worked in the first place. And so this is a very similar kind of situation where the drug company supports the group, and then the group takes money they get from donations and gives it to the drug company to be able to, you know, so it's this kind of, now look, they're doing it because they, I mean, the pharmaceutical industry wants to make the shareholders happy, but the, but the, you know, cancer group or whatever wants to do it because they really presumably care about, you know, the devastation that's being wrought, um, and they just may not understand. I mean, they, I mean, when you think of what's going to cure us, we need a new pill or a new procedure. I mean, that's just that's what medicine is. Now that comes from really great roots. That comes from penicillin. That comes from antibiotics. Where all of a sudden everyone dies, everyone dies. Then a doctor gives you a pill, then you don't die. That's awesome. Unfortunately, many of our drugs, most of our drugs, don't work like that. Um, and uh, and 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 in many cases, you know, it'd be better not to take them in the first place, um, as you know, adverse effects from um, prescription drugs kill about 106,000 Americans every year. Uh, one of our leading causes of death, actually. Um, and so, but look, there are other um, disease organizations that, uh, you know, that aren't funded by a big business um, and that may be more open to doing um, uh, research on, you know, kind of alternative, uh, alternative treatments. You know, frankly, I, I'm surprised there aren't more crowd, crowdfunding campaigns. Like, if you were a scientist want to do a really great study, Right, and you and you put something up on Kickstarter saying, "Look, you know, I there's these there's this rare cancer. I want to try something that worked." One patient came to me, said, "I used this herb, and my cancer disappeared." Um, and I, is that a fluke? I have no idea. Look, I want to take 20 patients. You know, this is terminal cancer. Nothing else we're going to do for them anyway, right? And so. Uh, but half of them are going to continue to be in hospice. The other half are going to be in hospice plus this herb. But, you know, I need money because we need to, you know, follow labs and we need to, all right, could you give me, you know, some money? And as soon as it's, I'll, I'll share the results with the world. This could be big or this could be absolutely nothing. We don't know. Don't you think people, even people that know no one with it, you know, think of the ALS challenge, right? Right. Most of the vast majority don't, have never met anyone with ALS, right? But it's a horrible disease. They can just imagine and look and they want to kind of, you know, kick in a little bit. So I would love to see more crowdsourcing of medical research funding. That's a really, really interesting idea. Um, and I did want to bring up the ALS thing. I don't, I don't mean to bash the organization at all. I know their their hearts are in the right place. I know people uh, that do it locally. And as you said, it's a hideous disease. Um, but uh, that recently, I came across an infographic and. Thank goodness I have infographics to uh, help me understand the world today. Uh, and it shows that the, the leading cause of deaths in America is almost 600,000 people is heart disease. 
but when it looks at money raised, uh, the number one thing is actually breast cancer, mm -hmm. um, with almost five times more money raised for breast cancer than for heart disease. And then uh, a fourth on the list was actually the ALS, even though mm -hmm. on this list it's dead last in the causes of death. Um, you know, it's just there seems to be such an imbalance in the, where the money goes for what kind of research. And I, I just wanted to get your comment on two things about the ALS challenges. I did go onto their website and looked at, from the organization that all the money went to, uh, their pamphlet on how to eat uh, very much emphasizes meat, poultry, eggs, dairy as sources of protein. Um, tell me, you know, where's the disconnect? Why aren't they looking at plant-based diet? Uh, well, I mean, I think the reason why you see much more money going to these other things than heart disease and number one killers, because I think there's this misconception that heart disease is just an inevitable consequence of aging. Like that's just what happens when you get older. Whereas any of us could be struck down with something like, you know, breast cancer, some of these other diseases which strike younger people and are seen as kind of, you know, uh, we're all vulnerable. Um, and there's something, you know, maybe there's something to do about it as opposed to something more random, whereas, well, yeah, of course your ticker's going to conk out when you get old. And little do people know that, no, there are entire populations where something like heart disease practically doesn't exist, doesn't, and, you know, I mean, this is not, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's based on our choices, and people don't know that. And if people did, maybe there'd be kind of something different to do about it. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I mean... So the ALS is really, the ALS story um, is really interesting. I have a video coming out um, on, on ALS. Um, uh, it's uh, you know, about 30,000 people. It's also, I mean, it's rare, but look, 30,000 people are fighting for their life in this country. Um, we each have about a 1 in 400 chance of developing uh, the dreaded disease. Um, so it's actually more common, I think, than generally recognized. The incidence is actually close. Um, uh, to multiple sclerosis. Um, and the question is, well, what causes it? And, you know, 50 years ago, um, uh, you know, researchers uh, found the rate of ALS on the island of Guam uh, by about 100 times the rest of the world. And so they were like, well, maybe this will give us a clue to the disease. So instead of one in 400, in some villages in Guam, one in three adults died from ALS. So um, uh, the uh, first uh, they first suspected something called uh, sicken trees, uh, since the powdered uh, seeds were a dietary staple of the natives, um, and uh, and when reports of livestock eating the seeds had neurological diseases, and indeed they found this a neurotoxin in the seeds called BMAA, um, uh, and so they thought well maybe that's what's causing the high levels of uh, ALS. Uh, but the amount of BMAA in the seeds people ate was so small, they figured, you know, they calculated that people would have to eat like, you know, 1,000 kilograms a day to get a toxic dose, like a ton of seeds a daily. So basically the theory was kind of th thrown out, the trail won't cold, until famed neurologist Oliver Sacks came along. Um, uh, he had an idea. He was like, well, you know, uh, you know the sickened uh, seeds are not the only thing the natives ate. They also ate fruit bats. Um, and what did the fruit bats eat? They ate uh, this, those seeds, and so maybe they thought it was a magn biomagnification of the food chain. Um, um, uh, and uh, so, uh, and that's how much, basically, you know, so you'd have to eat a ton of seeds, but uh, that much toxin it actually builds up in the flesh of fine foxes, tons worth of this BMAA, um, and they also ate other animals, such as wild pigs that forage on the seeds. And uh, so the, really the final nail in the coffin of this story was they detected high levels of BMAA in the brains of, um, of uh, all the native victims of the disease on autopsy, none of the control brains of uh, those that died. Um, and so this is kind of this final puzzle piece um, for the solution of this mysterious cluster on some exotic tropical island. Um, uh, but uh, the question is, um, uh, what about everybody else? Well, um, uh, so uh, when researchers went uh, and looked at um, brains on the opposite side of the globe in Canada, um, they did more autopsies, and they found, for example, when they looked at Alzheimer's brains, they had BMAA um, in the Alzheimer's victims, not in the control brains. They said, wait a second, Canadians don't eat fruit bats. Um, well, look, the, the toxin is not made by the bat, right? It's made by the trees, but, I mean, uh, it's, but we don't eat trees either. Actually, 
um, uh, it turns out that the trees don't make the neurotoxins either. It's actually a blue-green algae that grows in the roots of the tree that makes the BMA that gets into the seeds, it gets into the bats, it gets into the people. Um, uh, but it's not ju just one type of blue-green algae. Nearly all types of blue-green algae all over the world produce this stuff. Um, and so up until a decade ago, we thought this neurotoxin was confined to this weird tropical tree, but now we know the neurotoxin is produced by algae throughout the world, in Europe, the U.S., Australia, the Middle East, everywhere. Um, so if these neurotoxin producing blue-green algae are ubiquitous around the world, maybe BMAA is a cause of progressive neurogenic diseases like ALS worldwide. So researchers in Miami put it to the test. Maybe the Canadians were just a fluke. No, they found BMAA in the brains of Floridians who died from sporadic Alzheimer's and ALS, but not in the brains of those who died from different neurogenic diseases like Huntington's, um, which uh, we know is caused by genetic mutation, not by some uh, neurotoxin. So uh, significant levels of BMAA in, uh, in uh, um, uh, 49 out of the 50 samples um, uh, of, uh, from uh, uh, the uh, ALS patients. Um, and uh, they, we, uh, they found it in the Atlantic Southeast and the Pacific Northwest. Um, and uh, same thing in the brains of people who died from Alzheimer's. Um, and, and so you say, well, wait a second. And you can get more BMA in the hair of live ALS patients compared to controls. Um, and so you say, well, wait a second. We better check Floridian seafood. And they did. And they found high levels of BMA in freshwater fish and shellfish, oysters, bass. Um, on the bay, fish, shrimps, crabs, had the kind of BMAA levels comparable to that of the fruit bats in Guam. So in, in the U.S., the fish may be the fruit bats. So I'd really love to see more research talking about seafood consumption and ALS. That would be where my research dollars would go. Wow. That, that's, a, that's a pretty big wow for me. So you're pretty sure then that this BMAA is one, if not the root cause of ALS? We will find out when we do the research. Okay. Now we got all this money. Let's do it. <laughs> let's start the crowdsource. Yeah, well, they, the ALS has got the all. The, they've got the millions to do it. The the second question they had about that was actually, uh, as I we talked a little bit earlier. I, you and I were both involved uh, with a documentary about a, a gal who cured herself of a very serious nerve disease called RSD uh, through a raw food diet. Uh, and you know the doctors told her weeks before she started the diet that there were no nerves there to biopsy in her leg and then six months later she's walking without any assistance so obviously nerves can be regrown and she's kind of one person that demonstrated that perhaps a raw food diet can help do that do you know of any research uh, of, of raw food in general or specifically for nerve conditions or RSD or ALS or anything like that well, see, that's something that the research could do. So, uh, so she was on this kind of raw plant-based diet. Would a cooked or a combination of cooked and raw plant food diet done just the same? Was it the fact she was eating lots of healthy plant foods? She, or was it because it had nothing to do with that? It was just that she wasn't eating processed junk? Or did it have nothing to do with that and she just wasn't eating animal foods? You can imagine a bunch of different, you know. And so, look, when people, dietary interventions are perfect for Conditions for which we have absolutely nothing to offer. Mm. So when modern medicine throws up their hands and say, we got nothing for you, well, okay, well then, sure. you know, let's, let's, let's split people up into three groups and find out, you know. And look, these people are highly motivated, right? I mean, these, these are the people when you, you know, it's difficult to get the general population who feels fine to, right. you know, dramatically alter their diet for years on the hope that they won't have a stroke. Um, but to have people who are suffering, you know, people would be willing to, you know, eat wallpaper if, they, you know, people thought it would, um, uh, I, I just say that because Walter Kempner used to sit down with people and say, if I tell you you eat wallpaper, you eat wallpaper, <laughs> um, which, anyway, so, um, uh, but, uh, so, and, you know, look, so we could get dietary compliance and it wouldn't take many, right? I mean, uh, even if you had a small sample size, if you have a disease considered to be irreversible by the medical community, then a case report or a case series, small case series, um, could uh, you know dramatically affect things. And there's no downside. That's yeah. the critical piece, right? Yeah. When you have a drug that you're testing on somebody, you want to make absolute or a surgery. 
You want to make absolutely sure that the benefits outweigh the risks, right? So you need a high level of evidence just don't want to go around killing people. Right. But what if there are no downsides? In fact, what if there are actually benefits, right? So, you know, does, you know, exercising help with condition X? I don't know, but look, if it's not going to hurt, and look, it'll help with all sorts of other things, you tell people to exercise it. I mean, what level of evidence do you need to tell people to eat healthy, right? Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, let's do it. Yeah. Well, I, I saw in an interview where you, you usually put every one of your patients on a plant-based diet uh, for that very same reason. It may or may not help, but it certainly can't hurt. Do you still do that? And it's to end, it'll help. I mean, the number one, you know, cause of death for diabetics is heart disease, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so even before we knew that plant-based diets could reverse diabetes, you still put people on a healthy diet because, look, they're, they're going to die of heart disease. And even people, you know, something like, you know, a fibromyalgia or something, it's like, well, the last thing someone needs with a chronic pain condition is another medical condition, right? I mean, you know... Imagine having fibromyalgia and diabetes, right? I mean, so does it work for fibromyalgia? Well, we do actually have great data to show that it does. But even if we didn't, you'd want to do it just to keep them healthy um, and not get something else. I mean, there's, you know, I can't think of any circumstances where we wouldn't want to get people healthy to give their body the best chance possible to fight off whatever is going on, right? Seems no, it seems pretty logical to me. Uh, <clears throat> one thing I do want to ask about, but I know we're running short on time here. Um, I've got about two minutes. Okay, then this is a, we'll do this as the last question. Um, glutens. You are not firmly in the anti-gluten camp, um, is it? As it seems, where where do you stand on that? What's the research say about glutens? I stand nowhere on any topic. I just translate the science. Right. Okay. I am just the I'm just the medium by which the techno speak in the peer reviewed medical literature just gets, you know, can translate it, right? I have no opinion on anything. Okay. And tomorrow, when it says, when it, we find out that lo and behold, foie gras smeared veal is the best thing, then I'll, then I'll tell people to eat, you know. Um, but um, so, uh, okay, but so what is the science? Right. have to say about, so what does the best available balance of evidence have to say about gluten? And what it says is that there are three camps of people that uh, may want to stay away from gluten, and that's one, celiac disease, that is about one in 141 Americans. Number two is a wheat allergy, um, uh, which happens about one in a thousand people. And the third group, this new group, um, is this uh, gluten sensitivity, and we really still don't have a good idea of how large that group is. Our best estimate is a little over one percent, um, and so and all so for so for ninety eight percent of people, gluten is not just neutral but health promoting, right? I mean, so you can do. I mean, you can, there's actually experiments where they use isolated gluten and see gluten lowers blood pressure, for example, right? It's a plant protein. Why? Well, I mean, we 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 would assume that would help was healthy. Now, I'm not talking about refined wheat products you know, uh, white flour, white bread, white pasta. We should all eat whole grains, whole foods in general. Um, but, uh, but so for 98% of people, uh, gluten is health promoting. But for 2%, um, uh, or that's our best estimate at this point, uh, you, know, uh, you know, gluten, uh, someone with celiac disease, even continuing to eat gluten can significantly shorten their lifespan. It's a very serious condition. Um, but, uh, you know, but, you know, if you're concerned that you have are it fall into that gluten descent, um, uh, um, intensive camp, meaning you have irritable bowel type symptoms, chronic diarrhea, unexplained weight loss, cramping, etc. Um, then, rather than going on a gluten free diet, even though it might make you feel better, it's important to get uh, Crohn's disease ruled out first. Okay. Because if you go on a on a gluten free diet. Then you actually muck the muck up the ability to actually detect Crohn's disease. So then, if a month later you go to your doctor and you say, "Yeah, they got problems with gluten," and they test for you, you may actually have a false negative because the test is looking for inflammation in the lining of the intestine. If you haven't been eating gluten, there's no inflammation, and so they say, "Oh, you don't have uh, celiac disease." 
And so you want to get tested, make sure you don't have celiac disease, and then if, if staying off gluten makes you feel better, you stay off gluten. Um, uh, but I rather people not just go on a gluten free diet unless they've been tested negative first. Okay. Well, that's good advice, uh, as all of your advice is, and I want to thank you for being with us today. Tell us uh, a little bit about how people can get your latest DVD, video, and how to support your organization. Um, uh, so they can go to nutritionfacts.org, a um, nonprofit uh, website, make a tax deductible donation, want to support the work. All the money from the sales of books, DVDs, speaking engagements, all goes to charity. Um, uh, and you can sign up for free and get uh, free daily, weekly, or monthly emails on detailing all the new videos that come up on the site. Excellent. I think they should be required uh, watching in all of the waiting rooms across uh, the doctor's offices across America. So I, Sounds good to me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> thank you uh, very much, Dr. Michael Greger. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Uh, also earlier today, I had a chance to visit the East End Food Co-op and uh, sit down with uh, General Manager Justin Pizzella and uh, want to discuss an important and controversial topic when it comes to health. And of course, that's GMOs. Know Your GMOs is the name of an evening discussion. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting evening. So let's find out uh, more from Justin all about that. One. Hey, we're uh, here at the co-op today in the manager's office. I'm here with Justin Pazella. He's the general manager of the co-op. If you've been shopping here recently, you might have noticed one of these little flyers for the Know Your GMO. It's a GMO month today? Know it Your is. GMO month? Know your, well, it's non-GMO month. Non-GMO month. And, that's uh, a better way to put yeah, it. Yeah. It's co-op month. It's a lot of things. Oh, that's great. So, well, thanks for, thank you yeah. for talking with us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, you got a great event coming up, uh, and that's what we want to talk about here. But before we get into that, um, let's just talk a little bit about uh, what the goals of the co-op here. I've been shopping here 20 years. You guys have always been like the, the leading edge. For a long time, it was like the only place in Pittsburgh to get organics, right? Right, right. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, as a cooperative, we exist to fulfill the ends of the business and our ends um, basically are to enhance the physical and social health of our community. Um, you know, Pittsburgh primarily, but, you know, it, that extends everywhere. And we do that mainly through a number of different ways. The first and foremost is the store. So we have a um, member-owned um, cooperative store um, that's open to everyone. Um, the second is we have an ethical and resilient food infrastructure is one of our goals. So that's where the GMO and the food that's on the shelf, those sort of things, that ties heavily into fulfilling that ends. Um, and, you know, we have some other ends around, you know, having a creative vision for the future. And um, I'm forgetting the fourth, the, That's okay. the third but, one. But I think so. the important thing is it is one of the goals of the co-op yeah. to ensure the physical health of the yep. people that shop here. Right. So it's, 20 years ago, that was organics. And now the whole issue is GMOs. Well, it's not. I think I mean, organic is still the, a big part of it. And what, what sure. we're focused on is clean food. And the, the last end was to have a healthy, uh, vibrant community of happy, healthy people. So, well, we, uh, um, which is really what it is. And so all these tie together. And so we're, we're focused on is clean food. And as clean food, um, the, um, you know, really for me, there's a lot of things that go into it. It's, you know, certified organic definitely fits in there, but it's beyond that. It's basically food that doesn't have herbicides, pesticides. Um, it's really built around trying to sustain a, a, a a food infrastructure it's built on uh, soil based focus to have nutrients high nutrient content that sort of thing so mm. um, you know non-chemical GMOs big issue in it you um, do a lot of local sourcing we do we're about 22 percent this past year of our sales were local but it's important to yeah. note that you guys when people shop at the co-op they expect to find the very cleanest the very yeah, I think that's a fair assessment, and yeah. I know that that's one of the things that's really a focus for us is to ensure that we don't violate that trust, yeah. knowingly violate it. So, so from, from a business standpoint, you have a real difficulty in knowing whether, you're, uh, whether the GMOs are even in there. You're not totally protected by the government, is that right? Well, if it's certified organic, by definition, it's Okay, so GMO, certified organic. But once you yes. go beyond certified organic if it's a natural item and so we can't we can't trust the word natural on the no, natural 
could be actually not. <laughs> not <laughs> but, it, but I think it's important to say that occurring. there's a whole industry of health food that really isn't all that healthy no. by the standards of the science as exactly if, if you're paying so, attention to people right. like michael greger then yep right yeah okay. that's exactly it there's there's just there a lot of corporate misdirection if it's that. not certified organic and it is one of the suspected gmo ingredients and the list keeps getting longer um you know you just chances are you know particularly if it's soy or um, actually sugar beet yeah sugar cane sugar beets that's a huge one now that's in that everything right? um you know it's probably gmo Wow. Oil, oils are, it's, you know, the oils, especially soybean, vegetable, any of those, you just really can't trust. So there's them. whole categories of things that you can't yeah. even carry. If it's not anything. organic yeah. and, or now there's the non-GMO okay. verification. So, and that's, so a, that's that's an important thing too. I think that yeah. many brands are going that extra step and certifying yep. themselves yep. as non-GMO. Yep. So yeah, that's exactly it. And it's, you know, and it, it's, um, you know, I think a reliance on the government to regulate and certify these things is um, a bit misguided in, in the industry stepping up uh, you know, because there is a consumer demand for this sort of thing. Sure. And so they're, you know, they're stepping up and meeting an, an industry need. And that's what the non-GMO um, project certification is, verification. It, 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 you know, we'll get into the science next, but uh, it really is like whole countries are going non-GMO. Is yeah. that right? Many countries yeah. in Europe and South America? Yeah, there's a lot of countries that won't, um, that won't, um, farm with the GMO and it's just it's yeah they're making a wise choice because the science isn't there yet to support yeah. it even though you know the the manufacturers that that you know push the GMO um, crops will say it's there it's the science is still you know up for debate. Well let's get into that your your event is coming up on the uh, is it the 18th? Uh, yes or yeah the 18th. 18th yeah. 6th to nine. 6.30 oh, here, yeah. to 9 6.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. That's a Saturday night. Uh, Carnegie Mellon at the, the Conan Room. They're going to yep. be broadswords and... We'll see. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah. that's Conan, maybe. Conan, I think it is. <laughs> um, and so talk about... You're going to be one of the speakers. Uh, right. Talk about the other three speakers here. So um, the other speakers, um, Denise Caruso. Um, she is a researcher, senior researcher at CMU. Uh, she has written a book um, all about the risks of, um, you know, just GMOs and really in general, there's, there's a, you know, a, the, the incredible risk of introducing, um, you know, basically GMOs in this case um, into the environment when there's still a question, especially when, you know, they can really have massive contamination and, and things and, you know, and cross can contaminate products and so, or other, other you know, um, other, you know, non-GMO species and things. And um, so she'll talk about that. I won't get in, I won't get into hers too much. Uh, Tra just I, right there, uh, just a question on that. Um, yeah, I'd like to be clear too, you know, as a journalist to say, is the concern that we just don't know or are there known problems that have come up from GMOs or are there just indications of problems that we just don't have enough research yet? I think that it's probably more the latter, the indication, the, re, you know, the, the, the research just isn't there. Um, you know, the GMO manufacturers are uh, very, um, they basically don't allow the research to be done. They own the patent to okay. their seeds, so they, they don't allow independent research. And, and we should say patents. that the co-op, one of your goals is transparency. So exactly. the fact dealing with a company that is not transparent to the extreme is really goes against the, the, the right. co-op uh, ethic. Exactly. Okay. It. So your other uh, speaker, Trevitt Hooper? Trevitt is the um, owner and chef of Legume Restaurant. Great, great restaurant. restaurant. Oh, my yeah, God. Really, really oh. a great restaurant. And, yeah. Um, and so Trevitt's going to talk about, you know, the challenges he has as a restaurateur to, you know, that wants to be non-GMO and GMO free and, and the challenges of, of sourcing the products. And you said the sources for restaurants is even more difficult than it is well, for it's, you. Well, it's, it is, um, you know, the purveyors and things don't necessarily have even the access to some of the things that we have. And when you get into the quantity and sizes that you buy at the restaurant level, um, you know, they're not, they're not retail sizes. So the, um, the challenges to get those sort of things are, are huge. Mm -hmm. We've, we face the same thing here because we, with our prepared foods and, and things, we have those, we have similar challenges oh. in sourcing the same stuff. We, we basically go and 
take a lot of things off the shelf here. Your cafe is basically one of the few places in the city where you can know that you're getting non-GMO. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, Most of and, our cafe stuff's organic. So, okay. Um, it's if it's local, yeah, you know, we may have some things that we know how they're grown that aren't certified organic. But the Legume is yeah, doing but, the best they can there. Legume's doing a very yeah. great job. Good. And the third speaker is Brian Petrick. 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 Yes. Um, Brian is with Nugo. Okay. Um, and so he's going to talk about, he's going to come at it from a little bit different perspective. Yeah, that's a retail um, product. Those are the bars. The bars, right? and as a manufacturer, the challenges they have, they're going through a non-GMO verification. So my hope is um, that he's going to spend some time talking about that process and, you know, you know the, those sort of things. It's, it's been interesting hearing some of the things that, you know, when they, when they deal with their suppliers, um, they're getting, uh, you know, it's, it's actually encouraging because they're now getting, you know, when they go and say, Hey, we need to do not, we need to know whether your product's non GMO verified and that sort of thing. This, their suppliers are already there yeah. um, because they're getting pressure from other people. So this is, this, this, is, this, this is definitely a ground up. Yeah. Pressure. It's the industry, the industry and the consumer base is really driving at least the non, non-GMO non project verification. That's awesome. So this could be a really good event. So we've got yep. you as, you know, talking about sourcing it for a, for a store. Yep. We've got uh, Trevor talking about sourcing it for a restaurant. Yep. You've got Brian talking about sourcing it for product, processing it, to put it out in the manufacturing side. And you've got a, a, a researcher that's done, uh, written a book on the subject. Well, it sounds like a great event. It's Saturday, going to be an awesome event. Yeah, Saturday, October 18th at uh, CMU. Yeah. How can people find out more about it? Uh, they can go to our website, uh, which is www.eastendfood.coop, C-O-O-P. Um, that would be the easiest way. Okay. Um, you can always call into the store. Okay. So. Great. And hey, but tickets to be available uh, at free. the event. It's free. So you can no excuse. There's it's free. You can just show <laughs> up at like, CMU. Yeah, you just show up at, at the, the University Center Conan Room. Conan Room. Yeah. Um, that's great. And um, Saturday night. See you there. Well, yeah, well yeah. see you there. Awesome. Absolutely. Thanks very cool. much. Thanks, Ben. Okay. So that will do it for the <laughs> podcast today. Wicket and I both want to say thanks for watching, and uh, maybe he wants to get up here now. But hey, join us again next week, uh, every week at 4 o'clock Tuesdays for the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. You can find us on Facebook, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, and Stitcher. And of course, uh, if you want to join us face-to-face, -face, look for me at the uh, meetup.com. Look for the Integrative Medicine Professionals. Right, Wicket? Yeah, he's, a, he's a quiet one. All right, we'll see you again next time. Until then, be careful. Yuns, be careful out there. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.